Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to start with thanking um, the Vienna Biennale for the organization for inviting us. I am Aziza Hermel, I'm curatorial assistant in Kunsthalle Wien. Um, so tonight's panel uh, is titled The Natural Technology, which is a panel that has focused on practices and streams of thought that engage with rethinking the relationship between nature and technology, reconfiguring our planetary connections through epistemological systems that undermine the extractivist uh, logic that has long been facilitated by colonial legal mechanism and late capitalism. Uh, so we will discuss new mode of post-human feminist phenomenology that understands our bodies as being fundamentally part of the natural uh, world and not separated from it. Uh, we will also focus on non-Western and Western methods of ecological management, more specifically traditional ecological knowledge uh, which describes indigenous and other traditional knowledge about local resources. Um, I just would like to say a small word about a program that we did also in the context of the Vienna Biennale, which is titled Getting Wet, which was organized by Kunsthalle Wien. And tonight I should be standing here with my uh, dear colleague, Laura Aman, who unfortunately couldn't make it, but we have been working on this together. Uh, so we also curated this program titled Getting Wet uh, as well, together with Laura Aman. And in this program, uh, we've uh, been showing artists as Paula Baeza uh, Palamila, Sebastian Kaufuko, Katrina Daschner, Devil Aprens, um, uh, like Kara Kuntwat, who's here, and Trun Onsen, Patricia Dominguez, Denise Ferreira da Silva, and Arjunia Newman, and Barbara Capuzza. And um, it was a program where we showed mostly movies that were dealing with this idea of rethinking the notion of uh, technology and shifting it from a mere apprehension uh, of nature towards a deep attention to it. Um, so the first uh, speaker tonight will be uh, Kar Grundwag, who is here tonight with us. Uh, he's a visual artist, uh, born and raised in Tromso, and he's still based there. His work is, uh, has a coastal landscape in Tromso, both, both as a frame of reference and as a home. Uh, tonight he will be speaking about Stone Age science fiction, brewing with seaweed, uh, bacterial enzymes, uh, CO2, second string, and dancing. <laughs> and um, he will be also talking about re-evaluation of traditional knowledge and practices in relation to his art practice. After that we will have uh, Lukas uh, Likavichnam. Uh, who is a philosopher focusing on technology, ecology, uh, and visual cultures. He received uh, his degree in philosophy and PhD in environmental studies um, in Bruno in Czech Republic. Uh, he teaches uh, Central uh, uh, for Audiovisual Studies um, in Prague. And tonight, he, his uh, main theme is the, it's titled the metabolic, uh, the metabolic View, and it's based on the idea of image metabolism. And this contribution will be focusing on ramifications of concept of metabolism in biology and ecological economics. And it's, uh, it employs it as a philosophical device to index the continuum between the natural, technological, and the social. And uh, eventually we we'll have Astrid Anilemanis who will be talking to us from Canada. Uh, she is a Canada Research Chair in Feminist Environmental Humanities in the University of British Columbia um, in Canada. She's a cultural theorist working at the intersection of feminism and environmental change. And her research focuses on bodies, uh, water, and whether and how they can help us reimagine justice, care, responsibility, and relation in the time of climate catastrophe. 
Um, she will give a presentation entitled Caring for Science, that is an attempt to bridge epistemological divides between Western and colonial science on the one hand, and other forms of non-extractive human relations with the non-human world, so care, love, and support. Um, she uh, will draw on her recent work with the artist Pachi Chanj and scientist Alexia Nemanis, um, and she will examine how the scientific practice of necropsy can be understood as a form of care uh, for the stranded and how scientists in turn require support for the care work that they do. Uh, yes, so uh, thank you very much all for being here and I'll give the floor to Cora. So thank you, uh, Asisa, for that uh, lovely introduction. introduction. Um, so I'm grateful to be here. Uh, this is the first time I'm traveling after the event. So it's, uh, it's quite special to, for me to be here. Uh, I, I will talk a bit today. Uh, it, it's quite, well, quite an open sort of lecture. Uh, I will just start, basically, uh, with a quote from Sadie Plant as she writes in her preamble to zeros and ones, one of the nest descriptions of a pre-age, no future, no past, an endless geographical plane of micro-meshing, pulsing, quanta, limitless webs of interacting, leadings, leakings, mergings, weaving through ourselves, running rings around each other, heedless, needless, aimless, careless, thoughtless, amok. We had no definition, no meaning, no way of telling each other apart. We were whatever we were up to that time. Free exchanges, microprocesses neatly tuned, polymorphous transfers without regard for borders or boundaries. As I mentioned on the phone, I'm working on a project that is based on the notion that all times exist in parallel, Stone Age and science fiction side by side. I think this is an exciting starting point as it effic efficiently bre uh, breaks down classical hierarchies and notions of progress. It also opens up for a reevaluation of traditional knowledge that is not so grounded in nostalgia. Also in pers uh, perspective where we do not see ourselves at the top or end of a long development slash history, but the perspective where we are as much before something as after something. But also today, like any story needs a start, and this story starts with beer, a great many beers, as so many stories before. Maybe even the story of settled life and so-called civilization, even though that might have been a bad decision. Like James E. Scott writes in his book, Against the Grain, A Deep History of the Early States. Agrarian life, oh, sorry, that's not supposed to be good sound. Uh, agrarian life in the first pristine states came at a price, disease, slavery, and etc. And this is like so many other decisions taken after a few too many, you could say. And another anecdote I find really interesting in his assertion is that we have underestimated the power of fire as a landscape transforming technology predating Homo sapiens, and that Homo erectus' widespread use of fire to transform the landscape could also be seen as a starting point of the Anthropocene. In any case, we complained about the price of beer in Norway. We talked about making our own ingredients and all, and quickly realized that everything except the water would be imported from England, Germany, etc. And this is typical of life in the north. We always get to rely on Eurasian, east-west technology and culture. 
And that usually means the further south or north you get, the worse this technology works. And of course, the economy of scale and capitalism and all its relatives exacerbates this into perversity. Buildings not adapted to the climate, chain stores selling summer couture in winter storms, language spoken, spoken for thousands of years, marginalized, not taught in schools, state ownership of a majority of the land, a land seen as extractive resource, not home. In any case, we were fed up with this and, and also wanted cheap beer. And a vague memory of something I read poked the back of my mind, a story of Inuit making alcohol from seaweed. They vacuumed the World Wide Web for references and information about brewing with seaweed, but came up with pretty much, came up pretty much empty handed. So we turned our attention to just go for it, collecting seaweed, trying, talking, failing, brewing, reading. And during this exploration, we, we came across an old type of beer, or yeast, you could say, called kveik. A farm, use, farm yeast still in use in some of the valleys of West Norway. The brewers would sometimes carve intricate logs as vessels to keep the kveik in between brewings. And I think the implication of this is quite interesting in the sense that you had a brewer carving la living machines or architecture for invisible beings that make beer. And in this relationship, I would say the agency or sort of director of that relationship is pretty unclear. Is the brewer compelling the yeast to make beer or is the yeast compelling the brewer? And for us, this opened up a new line of thought. Sculptures or objects as architecture for the non-human. And I think the most like, interesting piece with this is it sort of breaks with some of the ideas of what a product or architecture could be in the sense that so much of what we do is it's based on an extractive logic and a, a, and a logic there in, in the moment something is finished, it also starts to break down. Whereas in a sort of symbiotic or mutualistic relationship between people or seaweed or yeast, you get something else. We, we worked further with this and we made for Liaf in 2019 sculptures that were based on this sort of recognition for seaweed. So we tried to sort of get into the sort of seaweed debate in Norway because it's, it's quite a large debate. And in most cases, it's large companies who's trying to sort of hijack seaweed as a means to greenwash their the farming of sa salmon as sort of cleansing the salmon farming using the seaweed to sort of extract all the extra nutrients uh, they pump out into the ocean. And we just wanted to take it back a second and try to like make an intimate uh, relationship between seaweed and people. So we made sculptures that also served as sort of a small scale seaweed farm. For Bergen, an exhibition that opened at Bergen Kunsthall last weekend, we continued this work uh, and we were working with uh, some ideas of a German architect from the 70s, German-American architect, Wolf Hilbritz. Uh, he did a, a seminal work in the 70s on bio or sea concrete, where you, by a process of electrolysis in seawater, can bind uh, carbon that's uh, floating in the ocean into chalk-like or carbonate compounds. 
and, and we use this as a substrate on the co uh, sculptures. Like a, the idea is basically that you have um, uh, two pieces of an uh, like, um, electrolysis and the cathode in this sense was the sculpture and it would bind the CO2, manganese and other materials in the ocean into sort of a crust onto the sculpture which will be a, like a perfect substrate for marine organisms. Um, and the idea is that when you turn off the electricity, the natural processes of the ocean continues these, the growing. So you have a material that is not decaying, but it's actually continuing, continuing to grow. In doing so, we also got some problems. This is the, um, the sculptures. They're made from 3D printed clay doped with a large amount of graphite to make them conductive. We wanted to do this because we wanted to sort of not rely so much on metal and the mining for metal. But we actually ended up in the same ditch. We, we needed graphite to do this and we sourced it locally from a graphite mine close to where I live which turned out to actually be owned by an Australian mining conglomerate. They sponsored this uh, graphite, and the same day we wrote this deal with them, it actually came out that they were in conflict with the local reindeer herders, which I also work for. And I think this is kind of an interesting and maybe one of the most like important points here, and it's that it's really difficult to avoid these situations. We are so sort of nested in this system. And how to proceed, you could say. I don't know the answer to that. But I know that working with it and acknowledging it um, is really important. Uh, Aziza? Perfect. Um, yeah. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> uh, I also said I would be talking about dancing. And when I say dancing, it's not really just dancing. It's sort of social projects. What you're seeing now is a transport of a bike trailer sauna that we built. It's placed in a valley near where I live. It's a, a valley that has been traditionally used by the Sami people. They're no longer there. They were couldn't get to the valley after we closed the border on Sweden. They would be living in Sweden in the winter and Tromsø, this valley, in the summer. And we have set up a camp there and we're doing workshops with the students at the Art Academy in Tromsø. What you're seeing now is a screening of a film called The Coconut Revolution. Uh, it's based on the re uh, rebellion on the Bougainville Island in the Pacific where they raised up against the mining company and actually waged war and had their sort of um, eco uh, revolution based on coconut oil, using whatever the mining companies had left, vehicles, running them on coconut oil, fueling actually a guerrilla fight. This is actual dancing. They're dancing on students dancing on wool, riff, re, like uh, wool not, that was not meant to be used, it was too bad quality, so they were going to burn it. And we used some traditional methods to felt it into large carpets by dancing on it. 
In our beer, beer brewing, we have experimented with a wide var variety of sort of traditional ways of processing seaweed, uh, different ways of enzyme, uh, adding enzymes to it. In the beginning, you saw a, a clip where we try to use the enzymes in spit to process it, to break out the starch. I would say, luckily, it didn't work. It was a very interesting sort of social setting. Uh, apart from this, we've tried different types of bacteria and yeast, like a koji culture used to ferment soy and rice. At this point, we have actually resolved the problem though we had to go to the industry. So we're using a potent enzyme which is extracted from a yeast culture, cellulase. So at this point, the whole idea of getting to brew with seaweed is kind of solved. With this method, we can make beer or alcohol from just about anything, a wood table for that matter. What we're seeing here is uh, a bird, Krykje in Norwegian, that has sought refuge in the cities in the last few years. The reason for this is multifaceted. Faceted. It's predation, it's global warming, it's safety in the city, it's overfishing. In any case, they have made their nests traditionally on large mountains and big colonies, counting several hundred thousand birds. And now they're moving into the city. And it's a big conflict. And we have some suggestions there, how to sort of facilitate the existing architecture, but also building new things, which could facilitate their existence in our cities. Many people have a, like a, a sort of a romanticized image of the North and the indigenous population, that, they're, that we are sort of closer to the earth or that we rely on traditional ways and methods. But the truth is in a way that the Stone Age and the science fiction live side by side. This is from a couple of years ago we work in the mountains in the cor corals and we mark and slaughter reindeer. But due to sort of regulations and zoning of land use, we are not allowed to use, to take the reindeers down to, reindeers down to the slaughterhouse alive because we would pass land that we can't. So we use helicopters to transport them. Thank you for listening. Sorry. Thank you for listening to me. I'm finished. Now. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, Aziza. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. That's perfect. So um, you can start your presentation. All right. I'm going to share my screen now. Mm -hmm. And now we should be able to see uh, the green color. Yes, thank you. That's perfect, yeah. So everything is set up. Can I start? I guess so, okay. So hello everyone, and thanks so much for uh, the kind invitation, Aziza and Laura. And also I'm really excited actually to present my research alongside such wonderful panelists, such as uh, Kara and Astrida. And I mean, of course, thanks also Vienna Bionil for the invitation. And I mean, I'm, I'm extremely excited also to present the short contribution that you can take a kind of, as a kind of exercise to heat up the engines of imagination and abstraction. And so my aim today is to explain a bit what does it mean to look at the planet as a process, as a kind of metabolic flux, not as a static entity with well-defined borders. And this, I hope, speaks well to research of my two co-panelists too, as my ambition is to demonstrate how to work with fluid ontologies as a basis of situational techniques of evidence and testimony. So uh, some underlying assumptions of the research I'm going to show you today are developed in my book, which is called Introduction to Comparative Planetology, and which was published by Strelka Press uh, two years ago in 2019. This book presents something that can be called an intertwined analysis of geopolitics of climate change and visual as well as philosophical cultures of imagining the Earth. But uh, there is also an update to the research done in this book which exists so far only in a form of a series of exhibitions I have curated for 11th edition of Photograph Festival in Prague, and which has opened only two days ago. That is also the reason why I'm not joining you uh, today in person, but only online, as the intense installation works didn't allow me to make even a short return trip to Vienna, despite I'm literally just a few hundred kilometers from you now, because I'm based in Prague and speaking, speaking from Prague at the moment. And I'm going to make one more footnote before I'm going to introduce the topic a bit closer. And that's that the pictures that I'm going to show uh, during, during this uh, presentation are mainly of uh, the artworks that are actually shown also or exhibited or featured in any other way at this year's edition of Photograph Festival called Earthlings. So uh, let me start with a literary parable of sorts. Uh, in Jeff Vandermeer's novel called Annihilation, which is the first part of famous Southern Reach trilogy, the main character, which is prosaically entitled The Biologist, encounters an alien organism that intoxicates the biologist with its pores. That results in changing the perception of the biologist. It changes her perception of the environment affected by a sudden arrival of an extraterrestrial entity. At one point, she calls this perceptual rotation, quote unquote, truthful seeing, a kind of ability to identify the slow and omnipresent muta mutation of the affected area into a sort of otherworldly habitat. At first glance, the mutation is subtle, almost imperceptible. It is only occasionally announced by unidentifiable sounds and modified behavior of animals or plants. But if one's eye is trained to see it, suddenly the whole landscape resembles a giant breathing organism, a kind of behemoth. The landscape is intensely alive with its tentacles moving in the background, camouflaged as an almost ordinary night sky. And so the reason why I begin my contribution with this parable is to make us acutely aware of how much perception perspective and epistemology matters when it comes to understanding the intrinsic logics of the planetary ecology, to design interventions that can restore biodiversity, that can restore safe carbon concentration in the atmosphere, or that can, for example, prevent a collapse of sensitive marine ecologies. Reading traces and indexes of the planetary metabolism 
is an indispensable starting point. Metabolism is thus the central concept of my contribution. It indicates continuity of natural, social, technological nexus, and it invites us to employ epistemic techniques and aesthetic strategies that defy modernist chandras of representation. As an example, imagine the role of sound. In a documentary expedition to Iceland I have recently taken part in, we have traveled through infrastructural choke points such as this hydroelectric power plant. Here, our team, composed largely of field recordists and musicians, uh, research the sonic landscapes that can sort of subvert the visual impressions of these places. These kinds of impressions hide the truth of the infrastructural processes under the mantle of innocent, visible, minimalist architecture. And so we have been made aware of the subversion of the visual body, the sonic, which indicated the pervasiveness of the environmental alteration by energy infrastructures, as well as how the visual objecthood of these infrastructures stands in sharp contrast with metabolic continuity of their sonic profile. In a way, we have been made to see truthfully by first hearing truthfully through the techniques of listening. So to unpack the notion of metabolism a bit better now, every organism can be imagined as a temporary clump of matter that aims to maintain its stable ordering by transforming the energy and matter it accepts from its surroundings. In biology, this process is called exactly metabolism. And it is usually divided into two parts. Anabolism, which is the process of creating more complex chemical substances through acquired energy. For, for, for instance, this process can be of anabolism, can be photosynthesis. The second part then is catabolism, which is the breakdown of chemicals into simpler components. And that's a process that actually releases energy. And examples of these processes are, for example, digestion or cellular respiration. But the trick is that it is not just an organism that can be imagined as an economy. Just as an organism maintains an intake of food from its environment, just as it decomposes food into basic energy carriers and nutrients, just as it builds, it builds new biochemical compounds out of these nutrients, and just as it maintains an output of waste and residual heat, so an economy can be imagined as a giant metabolism of sorts. And this idea was first formulated by Romanian-born economist Nicolas georgescu Regan. He developed foundations of contemporary ecological economics in his book, The Entropy Law and Economic Process from 1971. The picture he presents is one of ecological economics as a discipline that brings economic phenomena down to earth by treating them as material and energetic flows in the socioeconomic metabolism. Georges Corrigan was inspired in his approach by uh, Erwin Schrodinger and his thermodynamic definition of life, although one may, of course, hesitate to what extent this is too organicist and vitalist ontology of economics. But be it that way or another, ecological economics now uses the metabolic perspective on society and economy not just in a, in a sort of metaphorical way, because it became the basic ontology of its analytic models too. And of course, the idea of natural economy has been with us for a long time. It was discussed by figures such as Carl Linné, Charles Darwin, or Peter Kropotkin, and served as the foundation for diverse political positions and economic proposals. And today, however, it seems that the metabolic perspective is not merely the continuation of this historical line of thought through different means. Instead, it shows us that a sort of permeability between the human and natural economies is actually the default norm, to the extent that terms such as logistics or infrastructure can be applied equally well to industrial zones and ecosystems as an and also to the production and transport of goods, as well as to photosynthesis or food chains. However, we may perhaps take the metabolic perspective even further. What if we were to consider human culture and communication as merely continuations or prolongations of natural metabolisms? 
perhaps be able to find that around us are animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, non-living objects, and entire communities of organisms that constantly speak to us, that constantly show us something or warn us before something. Could we then see the natural infrastructure and logistics, not only in the areas of materials and energy, but also in the way messages about the past, present, and future of our planet are relayed? Consider this. The Pencil of Nature from 1844 is a short book by William Henry Fox Talbot. Here, the general public of the Victorian era first encountered the experimental medium known today as photography. In his introduction, Talbot claims that the images the readers will encounter bear no trace of human tampering. They are impressed by nature's hands, as he says. They are the results of the mere action of light and chemical reactions on the surface of photosensitive paper. And when Etienne Gilmaray invented chronophotography in the second half of the 19th century, he also believed his images captured the language of nature, mirrored in the perfection of a landing pelican. If the human plays any role here, it is only a supporting one. It ensures the existence of the photographic apparatus and pressing the shutter. To put it differently, I am interested in whether photography is not a medium of the representation of nature, but an, a sort of description of the medial character of nature itself, imprinting traces of biological, chemical, and geological processes into the photosensitive surface of the planet. Hence, I am interested in whether it is the case that we have rather discovered photography than invented it. Satellite images, for example, would then no longer be photographs of the terrain of the Earth, but photographs of an archive formed by the planet itself. Photosynthesis would then be not only the elementary metabolic process of plants, but also a metaphor of the photographic metabolism of the planetary ecosystem. And the idea of image metabolism is then but one of many instances of how to treat the planetary itself as a result of the metabolic ontology, the planetary as a generic space of encounter and of exchange. A fortunate consequence of this perspective is that it allows to overcome the duality between the global and the local. The language of the local becomes just a clumsy way how to express that the situational is not contradictory to the planetary. Instead, the situational is the primary site of the embodied observation of the planetary, or as goes a line from a text I have written with my colleagues at Digital Earth Fellowship Program in the Netherlands. The planetary is hidden in every grain of sand. And this perspective then may be complemented by appropriate evidentiary techniques. One example is an approach studied by Susan Shupley in her ongoing research project, Learning from Ice. Here, she explains how ice can be thought of as a natural memory medium saving traces of past climate conditions on our planet by trapping bubbles of air in the ice sheets of glaciers where they remain for millennia. Another example, one that fully unveils the indexicality of the climate aesthetics in the aftermath of the adoption of the metabolic perspective is the work of visualization theorist and designer Dietmar Offenhuber, who also contributed to the magazine that accompanies Photograph Festival I have mentioned at the beginning of my talk. Offenhuber developed the concept of quote-unquote autographic visualizations. Visualizations that are not some external representations of the phenomena, but are their self-presentations, self-diagrammatizations, if you will. The rings of the tree are the index of its age. The movement of grass is the index of wind. Our lungs are the index of the polluted air in the cities. Autographic visualizations are, according to Offenhuber, exactly what Etienne Gilles Marais called the language of the phenomena themselves. And the design intervention here is not the one of creation, but of an evidentiary practice based on facilitation and on curating 
of the biosemiotic exteriority of the planetary. So my hope is that accounting, that accounting for evidentiary techniques changes also the status of artistic or architectural practice. These practices turn out to be primarily about elongation of knowledge and relaying of testimonies, not about artistic individuality and egocentric gestures. Because after all, art solves nothing. Art simply slowly grinds down, washes out, and adds precision to intuitions that arise from the everyday experience of the direct urgency of external reality. The history of natural techniques of imaging, such as photography, shine a light on the path. And that's all from my side for now. And please, if you plan to travel to Prague, you can see the exhibitions of Photograph Festival until the end of October. Thank you so much. Hi, Lukas. Unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to say hello. Uh, okay. Thanks so much for the presentation. <laughs> no, I... Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that I was too fast. No. Okay. Is it okay if I stay online, muted, and without the video? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. So, Hello. Hello. <clears throat> can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. Yes. Great. So you can start your presentation now. Okay. Thank you so much. You're Hello, welcome. Astrida. Hello. Oh. So um, I am going to just minimize the Zoom here a little bit. And I was just watching, um, watching the other presentations uh, on the live stream. So that was wonderful to be able to be there, at least in that small way. So uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Aziza, for already introducing me earlier in the session and for inviting me to take part in this. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am zooming into you today from the unceded silk territory in the Okanagan in Kelowna, BC, Canada. Today, I want to share a short paper about an ongoing project that I'm working on with artist Patty Chang and veterinary pathologist Alexia Namanis. I hope to offer it in the context of this panel as perhaps a slightly different way to think about scientific technology and practices of care in ways that perhaps trouble distinctions between scientific and artistic ways of knowing, particularly in relation to non-human beings. Um, I enjoyed the prior two presentations, but I, I suppose, you know, uh, watching them, I'm thinking, oh, science is so cool. And uh, uh, in my presentation, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about science potentially as care. So I'm not going to share my screen today. I'm just going to talk, I think, because of the short time, that will be easiest. Let's begin. Prologue, 12th of May, 2021. 3.02 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Little girl. You are running your hand smoothly along the skin, moving from the head down the animal. You are feeling for net marks. Bycatch, female, found in the beginning of March. Not emaciated, possibly poor condition. No other abnormalities. Fingers pressing into flensed side belly. Traffic is waking up. Outside, I could see the faint sparkle of the Big Dipper. 3.46 a.m. Scoring the blubber, stacking it up. Someone is taking it from the table. Now I'm with you. I'm at the mammary gland. It looks pretty inactive. I tried to express milk, but there was nothing there. There's a little bit of hemorrhage, base of the skull, back of the neck, likely when the animal was caught in the neck, in the net and was struggling. Remove the apaxial muscle. Now I'm going to open the abdomen carefully. It is a little girl with immature ovaries, which I'm going to remove 4.07 a.m. I'm using a new scalpel. You probably can't see me here. I'm just out of the field of vision. I'm slicing through the pancreas, removing the tongue, then trachea, popping out the epiglottis so I can remove the rest. 
the lung, the heart underneath it, the uterus, the ovaries, the bladder underneath, 4.51 a.m. Examine the respiratory tract. My daughter's calling. Hello? Yeah? Yup, 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 hey, hey. Okay, liver. It's actually really beautiful, firm texture, color as it should be. It is almost completely light. The birds outside getting louder. 5.17 a.m. The body is open like a mouth. We're getting closer to the end here. No other overt pathology. That's it. The table looks clean. That's it for today and for me, 6.23 a.m. Part one, when death is all around. We live in a time of almost unfathomable loss and we are called to respond. We are called to respond to that which we cannot fully understand and we are called to understand why and how we are called. These words begin in an essay by anthropologist Deborah Bird Rose written almost a decade ago called In the Shadow of All This Death. Rose was a leading figure in the field of environmental humanities. Her later work in particular was interested in questions of death and extinction and how these phenomena reshape worlds. Debbie died a handful of years ago too early from cancer. Lately, I find myself returning to this work. There is so much death around us. This presents not only as the death of individual beings, but also as the end of species, as the end of ways of life, the end of possibilities and the end of relations. As Deb Rose suggested, even though death must be an important part of life, death is sometimes not only death, but double death. In the sixth great extinction, which cannot be understood as separate from capitalism, colonialism, militarism, heteropatriarchy, and other violences, not only do individuals die, but their entanglement in other beings' ways of life dies too. Patterns of embodied connection wither and shrink. As you no doubt know, many marine mammals are among the many species currently dying. Whales, dolphins, and porpoises, also known as cetaceans, breathe air like you and me, give birth to live young, take considerable time preparing those young for life on their own. They're highly intelligent with complex social lives. And although their ancestors were once land-dwelling mammals, about four million years ago, cetaceans forsook terrestriality for a more watery existence. Some made an admirable comeback after the decimation caused by large scale whaling industries in previous centuries. But now cetaceans are imperiled anew by noise, hunger, garbage, traffic, and heat. Double death is thus also caught in the ocean's currents, but this double death at sea is mostly occurring beyond our field of vision. So how are we to respond? This talk draws on pilot project research I've undertaken with artist Patty Chang and wildlife pathologist Alexia Namanis, who leads a marine mammal disease surveillance program at the National Veterinary Institute of Sweden, or SAL. This project also has important contributions from our collaborators, Dr. Jamie Wang in Hong Kong, Sue Reed in Australia, Tara Nicholson here in BC, as well as a number of scientists and activists who have generously given their time to speak to us. This research concerns stranded cetaceans. On the frayed edges of the watery habitat they call home, these stranded animals have taken their leave among us terrestrials who are called on to respond. Some scientists respond with the Western scientific practice of necropsy that is the post-mortem examination of an animal in order to try to understand its death. These scientists are afforded a rare opportunity for a kind of intimacy with these animals. So this talk is an invitation to you to understand this practice as a complex form of care and as one kind of response to the stranded under conditions of climate catastrophe. Part two, science as a form of care. Western science has a lot to answer for. Fallacies of objectivity, excessive extraction, 
fraught intimacies with colonialism and capitalism and other charges animate calls for science to be accountable. Yet those of us committed to feminist, anti-racist, decolonial and queer approaches to environmental urgencies might be ambivalent in advancing some of these critiques. Of course, we want to question certain premises, but we also recognize the urgent value of much scientific research. This tension is even more palpable now in this so-called post-truth era, where critique can be easily conflated with denials of all kinds, propped up by an absurdist knowledge scape where to say anything loudly and brazenly enough can apparently make it true. So this presents a bit of a baby and bathwater problem. No science is innocent or value free of that we can be sure, but where does that leave us? It leaves me for one curious, a curiosity I brought to this project alongside more extensive research and interviews with animal pathologists and biologists, this pilot project centered on the observation of live streamed porpoise necropsies conducted by Alexia in her lab in Uppsala and watched by Patty and me from our respective homes in North America. We were curious, what might these observations teach us about science scientists and care for the stranded? So let's begin again in the necropsy room. 12.48 AM, liver unremarkable, no parasites, stomachs, only four stomach opened, mostly empty except three to five milliliters of digestive slurry, no parasites, kidneys unremarkable, spleen unremarkable, adrenals possibly mildly atrophic, cortex histo, bladder small unremarkable. Repetition, precision, patience. A necropsy can take half a workday or longer, which does not include the preparatory labors nor the distribution and disposal of the remains. About three hours into the first live stream, I write in my notes, I don't think there's anything I do that requires this many hours of uninterrupted attention to something or someone else. We talk a lot about the importance of protocol. Three slices, one dorsal 18, one lateral 17, one ventral 21, two dorsal 17, two lateral 17, two ventral 20, three dorsal 16, three lateral 17, three ventral 17, four dorsal 19, four lateral 15, and then there's nothing, 3.13 a.m. To an outsider, the practice might appear coldly surgical, but we learn that it is a deeply sensual affair. I go a lot by feel to tell me where I'm supposed to cut, you tell us. Other scientists we speak to talk about the smell. You can tell which species you will be attending to by the scent of the room when you enter, one tells us. Another mentions how in comparison to porpoises and seals, the whale she sampled smelled very different. Darker was the word she used. All of the scientists we talk to repeat the importance of staying attuned to the animal as a question of respect. When I hesitatingly asked you about adopting an objectifying stance toward the animal, you were taken aback and annoyed. I don't do this for me, you said. Everything that a body accumulates needs to be accounted for. We do this for the animal. This is for the animal, the ones that came before, the ones that will hopefully come after. So words are tricky. We later spoke about the possibility of untethering objectification from mastery. Part three, witnessing necropsy. Everything is so rotten, it might be an exercise in futil futility because the rest of the uterus is missing, opening here. Everything has been washed away. The diameter of I don't know if you can see this, the diameter of the uterus of the cervix indicates she's been pregnant before. So yeah, external bits bitten off. This whole thing has been contaminated. Okay, okay, there's nothing more I can do here. As always, Patty and I are watching through the portals of our laptops. 
We are hovering in the corner of your screen, which we know is placed on a small trolley that attends you as you attend to this animal thousands of miles away from us. Because of time differences for Patty and me, it's the middle of the night. This rented townhouse is dark and quiet. As you proceed through your protocols, the birds outside here are getting louder. Soon traffic does too, and all of a sudden the sky is lit up. My kids come downstairs for breakfast. Although this animal was already severely decomposed with many parts of it already scavenged, the necropsy went ahead anyways. There's nothing more I can do here, you said, but I'll do it just to say that I did. During these sessions, you recite a running commentary out loud. At first, Patty and I asked a lot of questions, but now we're mostly silent. I keep myself awake by taking freeform notes, usually 20 or more pages per session. I don't quite know why, but it feels urgent to write down everything. This ambition soon gives way to an aching wrist. It's impossible to hold it all. Any photography or recording of the necropsy room or the animal are not permitted. So instead I watch Patty watching you. Her hair is glossy black, her facial expressions, an index of what is happening on the table. I often get absorbed in the rhythm of the note taking, focused on your voice, my head stays down for two or three minutes. I'm surprised to look back up at the screen and find the stainless steel table is mostly empty, the animal components already removed, a blue gloved hand hosing it down. These animals are so elusive. Your voice is still steady, methodically working your way through your notes. Porpoise, previously frozen, parts of body, female adult, cannot determine body condition, severely autolyzed, sitting in the fridge so long, suspected bycatch, but undetermined, 2.21 a.m. As part of the project, Jamie interviewed several scientists about the emotional aspect of this work. One barely hesitated in her response. When you look at their stomach contents, she said, it brings you back to the mundane life of the animal you can often see what they were doing, where they were swimming right before death. I go over my notes from the first necropsy I watched. It was nighttime for me, but mid afternoon for you. Your daughter called you on your cell phone. I can't talk right now, you told her. I'm doing a necropsy. You carefully checked the organs of the porpoise for parasites. You made notes. This was a juvenile male, good nutritional condition, not yet weaned. The animal's stomach still contained its mother's milk. Deborah Bird Rose writes that in living with the dying of others, we bear the burden of witness. But more than that, writes Rose, the ethical burden is a question of, quote, how we inhabit the death zone, how we call out, and how we refuse to abandon others. Against this vortex of death, she asks, what does one have to offer? Double death, writes Rose, also doubles back to claim us too. Even when the dead are not our kin, we are tangled in the ecologies that made their life and their death, even if only by proxy. Witnessing as a kind of response is thus strangely reciprocal. What you give and what you get within a weave of life whose frayed fabrics further unraveling, we want to help stay. This cannot be the only response to the violence that masks itself as inevitable, but it is one response. Part four, how to grieve in cetacean time. The dead are still waiting for us to catch up. We lag, we hold into other times and other measures. That's how, perhaps a bit melodramatically, I began my notes of the first necropsy I watched. We were supposed to start at 2 a.m., but there were delays on your end, so we finally got going around 2.45, and four hours after that, we were done. The time gets folded up and tucked into the night, feeling the next day like either a dream or something that happened very long ago. You tell us about the strange temporality of the work you do, the manic rush to get things ready that falls into the meditative slowness of being with the animal on the table. During one of the necropsies, you confess, I had a hectic day, I'm quiet now, 
because I am enjoying just being with the animal. The three of us have a standing Friday meeting. Although these meetings have been going on for months, none of us can ever remember what time they're at. When are we meeting again? One of us texts our WhatsApp group. We can never keep it straight. Cetacean time becomes our emergent shorthand for the way time keeps wrinkling and stretching, folding in or slipping away. In another team meeting, we talk about the freezer as a key technology of cetacean time. One of the pathologists that Jamie talked to described the importance of freezers. Necropsy of the stranded is enabled by the proximity, availability, size, and quality of freezers. Freezers seem to be a technology of suspension and by extension, one of the modalities of cetacean time. Freezers holding cetacean time, holding it in suspense. Before you begin each necropsy, Patty has asked you to take a photo of yourself with your hand on the animal. This ritual is excessive. You don't need to do it. But as the series of necropsies rolls on through the spring, you tell me and Patty about how you have come to cherish this time in the freezer, just you and the animal, both a part of and in excess of scientific practice. In May, you show me an old photo you found of yourself back in the Bay of Fundy from the 1990s when you were doing porpoise rescues with the research station there. You were sitting in the boat, a rescued porpoise quickly brought aboard before it could be safely returned to waters outside of the fishing nets. Your hand rests on the back of its gray body. Deborah Bird Rose has also written about what she calls quote, multi-species knots of ethical time. This is when intergenerational time of the animal in the form of species kinships intersects with the now of the animal and its present entanglements with non-kin species that nourish it in its lifetime. So I think if the freezer is a technology of cetacean time, it's also a habitat for the tying of a multi-species knot but the kind that we insist on tying even and especially when death is all around us. And finally, part five, caring for science, caring for scientists. Who cares about these animals who are washed up on our terrestrial shores away from their own kin? Given the state of our planet's oceans, care here requires a commitment to these animals' lives and to their ongoingness Care requires a refusal to see their kind as already dead or their deaths as individuals or species as inevitable. In the end, a central question that our project asks is this, might science and the scientific practice of necropsy, its unconventional intimacy, its attentive protocols, its strange suspensions in cetacean time, might this also be a form of care? This is not an obvious, or simple proposition. I am a swim in all kinds of tensions, instrumentalization, objectification, theoretical abstraction, dangerous analogy. All of this chafes against the desire for beautiful poetry and a satisfying ending. Just pay attention, I have to keep telling myself. Instead of truth, go for honesty. In one of the necropsies, I watch your palm as it rests on little girl's back. You are holding the animal, but the animal's body is also supporting you. Literally, I mean, this is just a material fact. The animal's body supports your hand because it is no longer supported by the sea. And succumbing to terrestrial gravity, this body has now stranded on your table. Holding is complicated. The project teaches us that nothing can hold everything. We begin to understand that this kind of care requires not only the narrowing of the aperture to see the animal in granular detail, but also the capacity for concomitant pulling out to see the worlds that the animal holds and is held by or not. These worlds are mostly a tangled mess, but nor are they already dead. But Patty also asked in one of our last meetings, who cares for the scientist? Western science is no doubt flawed, 
but we are also now watching all around us as science is co-opted for political gain and capitalist growth or worse, ignored and denied altogether. Under such circumstances, what support can we extend to science and scientists in their extension of care to the stranded? Might science, when understood as care, be reconfigured? Might art, Patty suggested, be for science a form of care? 11 June, 2021, I write in my notes, Strangely, with each session, these seem more like individual beings, not less. The stomach is full, it's jam-packed full of food. It means it fed just before it died, otherwise in good condition, in good health. Robust, healthy, lots of fluid in the lungs. I notice how you lay your hand on the only piece of skin still intact on the animal. I think we're ready, you say. 5.29 a.m. And that's all. Thank you, uh, Cora, Lukas, and Asnalida for these beautiful presentations and also for accepting the invitations. Um, it's really great to hear you all together. Um, I would like to... Yes? Oh, yeah, on mute. Okay. I would like to... Uh, I will start with just a few questions, but uh, it would be also wonderful if the audience... Um, wants to ask anything or participate in the conversation. Um, I will start with this idea of the reparative reading um, that is common to these uh, three presentations and uh, that invites uh, scientists to see their work in a different light and also uh, non-scientists to be part of it. Um, when I was reading uh, this idea of reparative reading in the presentation of Asrida, I was of course thinking about um, the idea of the paranoid reading and the reparative reading and uh, um, how, how the reparative reading undertakes a different range of effects and, um, and ambitions and risks and um, and how we can learn from such practices uh, that are perhaps um, uh, trying to extract sustenance from the objects of a culture, uh, even of a culture whose like whose evolved the desire has often not to sustain them. So there is a contradiction between what you are defending and um, and what you are uh, criticizing, and maybe. Uh, some of you can talk a little bit more about this desire to uh, talk about this reparative reading in relation also to hope and to working uh, towards a change without really believing in the change and, and how, uh, uh, how are the methods for that. Um, any one of you can start. Shall I start? Is that okay? Please. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. It's yeah. It's a very nice thread that pulls the very the three presentations together. I mean, I was thinking explicitly about reparative readings, as you know, Aziza. Um, and I, in some ways, I think it's such you know this this is a a structure for those of you who don't know, introduced by the theorist, literary theorist Eve Sedgwick, where she talks about the reparative reading versus the paranoid one. And although she wrote this, you know, many years ago, it's just, I think, such a parable for the times we are in, you know, particularly this choice of words. Do we want to repair or do we want to be paranoid? Um, right now, as we look at the world around us, it just seems so apt. I think, you know, particularly people who've gone through, uh, you know, Western university training, you know, we've, we've been so well trained to be good critics, to sort of pick apart everything and find the gaps and find the flaws and find what's wrong with it 
And of course we need that. And I think it's important to say that, you know, Sedgwick never said we shouldn't do critical readings. She just said, we also need to do reparative readings. Um, and so, you know, this project that I'm working on, for example, was very much about that. You know, I entered it with a bit of trepidation. My sister is the scientist who I speak about. And, you know, she's a biologist and a pathologist. And, you know, we've always had a bit of tension, you know, as me, the humanist and her, the scientist. And I had a bit of trepidation becoming so intimately involved in her work because I was afraid I would just always want to be critical of it. And what I found, you know, as a, you know, the sort of feminist decolonial critique of Western science, you know, and what was so amazing by, you know, using this arts-based sort of focus of attention to what she's actually doing in the room allowed us to both Patty and myself from the artist and sort of humanist side and Alexia herself to really come to see her work in a different light. When you pay attention to what's there, you see that of course we can critique all sorts of things, but what is happening right on the table is an act of, of love and hope and care and tenderness and intimacy. And we certainly don't wanna throw that away. And we certainly don't wanna throw that away when this kind of scientific practice is also, like it's also what we need. It's not the only thing we need, but we also need it. I guess I can elaborate a bit on uh, what was just said uh, and to perhaps approach the question of reparative reading a bit from the perspective of how it mirrors certain ev uh, evidentiary practices that I was trying to show in my presentation, since they all show some kind of, uh, you know, ethos or morality related to honesty and fidelity to the event instead of this kind of paranoid, paranoid att um, attitude, let's say. So um, what reminded me, one of the sentences from Astrida's uh, uh, presentation about how to untether objectivity from mastery, it directed me to this beautiful book by Lauren Duston and Peter Gallison about the history of objectivity and how objectivity arised first in the 18th and 19th century as, a, let's say, a moral category before it became a methodological category of Western science. And it was related to this kind of male dominated cultural field where actually withdrawal from the event was the condition of uh, discovering the truth. And this kind of withdrawal, I think there's something very toxic about saying that actually you have to detach yourself to actually invest in some kind of truthful seeing. And that would be my kind of comment into that because to me, uh, I guess that there is a possibility to reinvent objectivity outside of the scope of, uh, let's say, the, um, the the mastery that Astrid was called about was talking about, and to me that hope is also through the way how we can work with the visual and the sonic, for example, as I was talking about at the beginning of my lecture, as a certain way how to subvert dominant modes of uh, scientific aesthetics, because in the end, I guess that the last 200 years or so of the modernist aesthetics trained us to see catastrophes as something that is uh, beautiful or sublime. And so there is an urgent need also to reconfigure this, I mean, web of analogy on analogies and metaphors that happen between the registers of the scientific perspective, the aesthetic, uh, the aesthetics of art and the other related fields of representation. Wow. Uh, uh, so I think I'm just going to derail a bit uh, and comment a bit on, uh, I just thought uh, your presentation as that was so beautiful and like especially sort of the autopsy description of little girl. Uh, and I'm just going to comment a bit on that because it's as the, the last sort of little video snippet I, I showed of these reindeers flying away. The place we flew them to was actually the sort of home slaughterhouse uh, and the sort of similarity uh, between sort of an autopsy and, and the slaughter and also with the, the intimacy of the sort of putting your hands into the sort of still warm animal and also observing the, the life and I, I just remember especially one uh, young female a reindeer calf which was two two years who had damages from uh, an avalanche and, and how we noted that she had still milk uh, in her uh, glands even though she didn't have a calf so the calf had been had been killed recently and um, but just a sort of uh, 
putting words to this sort of feelings, uh, uh, this sort of care, because there is also in, in that situation when you're uh, decapitating and parting it and you're putting your hands in, you're separating the skin from the body. It's actually like hard work and you're struggling with it, but it's also a, a form of care, I would uh, argue. So uh, my question is maybe, uh, um, would you like to comment on my claim? <laughs> that's, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think so, right? Like, uh, a part of, the, I think part of what you're speaking to is uh, an inability that many uh, Western societies now have to um, confront death and to uh, approach death as a part of life. And I think, you know, things like this pandemic have shown that as well, again. Um, so, I mean, I would be, although of course I'm not very intimately uh, familiar with or witnessing of the kinds of practices you're talking about with reindeer, I would, you know, venture to say, yes, you know, any practice that is about, you know, helping a good death or helping, you know, um, uh, usher uh, a being across that threshold, you know, is, is care. And, um, and paying attention to how we're going to respond to endings and deaths of all kinds feels particularly urgent right now, right? You know, so um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear more about those those moments. Not right now; it's not the time. But uh, that's really beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Yes, I was um, also thinking about. Um, Again, another common point, which is this, uh, first of all, the poetics in these three presentations and like the importance of uh, somehow the wording and finding um, other means to um, speak about these matters. And um, I was going to start with uh, a sentence that I think you were saying, Lukas, which is the situational is not contradictory with the planetary and how Astrid Anemanis in, in your text in, in, in uh, Hydrofeminism, uh, where you speak that about the space between ourselves and our uh, other is at once as distant as, as the sea, but also as close to our own skin. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, I think, a bit. But um, also uh, how in Cora's work, there is this idea of collapsing timelines, and I think this reminds me also to uh, Denis Ferrer da Silva um, idea of uh, a possibility of a thought beyond uh, determinacy and beyond uh, uh, separability. So that, that there is actually a possibility to uh, approach uh, nature or our world uh, uh, not from, from, a, from a point of view of being separated. And I think this, this idea that comes, of course, from the Enlightenment and from the modern thought that, it, that the only possible human thought is related to being separate to these things or being separate to history or, being, or that times are, of course, linear and that all these things are collapsing is, of course, very complex and very difficult because we don't know how, from where to start and how to deal with it. But I feel there was an attempt in these three presentations to actually deal with this in a very... Uh, um, attentive and still analytical and that does not um, uh, abstract the matter to a point that we, we are not able to talk about it. And maybe you, you want to say a bit more about this. Yeah, Cora. Yeah, uh, I, I could try to formulate something. Um, uh, I, I think, like speaking on my part, you, you could also like reformulate it a bit and you could say, like if you go down to the like sort of core problem, maybe it's this sort of duality of man, nature, and how, how this is such a bad tool in a way of understanding the, the world around us. And like a, a better formulation would maybe be that when uh, 
I'm looking at nature, it's nature looking back at itself, in a way. Um, and I'm more just trying to find sort of tools to sort of uh, be able to work with this perspective, I think, uh, is what I'm trying to do. Maybe on the more methodological note, the poetics that uh, we can talk about is also related to the question of metaphor and the way how metaphor can be used as a wonderful cosmological engine uh, that can actually, you know, produce associations that are otherwise uh, impossible to trace so easily in a very analytic, uh, category, uh, categorically oriented framework. And so uh, to me, many times also this choice of the wording is the way how to perhaps rethink that very fine web of topology that sits on top of uh, thinking in that way that when we, for example, talk about the planet in the categories of the global versus the local, it, it, it immediately that invites a certain, uh, you know, uh, scaling and zooming in and zooming out. And that's already some kind of like topological, you know, register. And to me, like changing the wording, using categories like the situational and the planetary. That also means that, no, let's not talk about space. It's, the, it's not the right way how to approach the problem of uh, the planetary. Instead, let's talk about the time. Let's talk about the continuity and the time scales that are implicated in, let's say, the geological durations and so on. So to me, that is important from the perspective of how actually a linguistic choice can lead to some kind of perspectival rotation of sorts. In the end, one of my favorite philosophers, Gilles Chatelet, he used to say that metaphors and diagrams are the two moments when being is glimpsed smiling. And I think it's a wonderful way how to, you know, uh, talk about that cosmological productivity of the metaphor. Yeah, this is a great question. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, uh, like all of the comments and Aziza, how you described it is as a sort of a legacy of the enlightenment and sort of Newtonian sort of geometries and linear thinking and, and sort of uh, progressively divided time that moves forward. You know, all of these are, you know, habits, right? And they're habits that are deeply ingrained in the way we think. But I think the good, you know, the good news is if we learned them, we can unlearn them. And we just need the methods and tactics and techniques to start slowly unlearning them. And of course, many, you know, I'm speaking as a Western sort of educated person, you know, other societies don't need to unlearn them. They're already there. Um, but for myself, I think poetics is one of those techniques and tactics that I can use. I mean, the language of artists is another one. I'm not so uh, skilled at, but poetics is my tactic of choice. And um, here, you know, I, years and years ago, when I was reading uh, the phenomenologist uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty for the first time, one of my favorite passages in his work is about first order and second order language. And, you know, first order language being when you can make language speak as though for the first time, you know, second order is just the habit when you just put all the associations that you already know, but first order is when you can make language speak in an entirely new way, right? And I think if that, that is one way that we can train ourselves to un unlearn these habits of separation. And I think, yeah, Denise's work on, you know, um, a difference uh, without separability, you know, is, is so important here. Yeah, I agree. Um, maybe there is someone in the audience that wants to ask something. <laughs> um, if not, then I will continue with another question. <laughs> uh, I think, um, I mean, you already answered so much like through these two questions, but I would like to maybe also move towards this idea of care and um, which is like, of course, now a word that is, has been used and also misused and, and to also think about science as care. It is really like such a, a shift in the, um, in a, um, in our way of uh, looking at science as also like as its forms of violence, but at the same time to acknowledge as well violence as um, part of uh, the process of life 
uh, and that is also, uh, for instance, a moment of an autopsy or a moment where a helicopter is taking reindeers up to the sky. It is also a moment where um, uh, we are able as well to uh, unveil uh, the abstractness of violence, the structural one, into a, the into a more uh, concrete one and uh, just like for instance during the revolution there is a moment uh, where um, for instance the the government uh, the government's violence become become visible and how how uh, this ethics uh, in relation to violence have to also somehow uh, change in order to acknowledge as well certain practices um, and that uh, care is also like it's not contradictory to a certain form of violence. And maybe you can something, say something about this, Astrida or Cora, Lukas. I'll just briefly begin, I mean, by affirming, I suppose, what you've said. I think you're right that, you know, we have to understand care as, you know, messy, difficult labor, you know, um, fraught and sometimes violent. Uh, and I also think you're right. Like, I, I really like the way you, you started that by saying, you know, care is a word that, you know, we have this problem, right? If we find a good word and then we use it to death. And um, this again, I think goes back to the previous question about poetics. How can you make these words speak anew? You know, right now, because of the state of the world, it's almost impossible to evoke words now like freedom or, um, uh, I don't know another one, but you know, like these words have just been so sullied and weaponized that um, it's, it's hard. So I think, you know, this, I guess what we're all doing is this return to the material attention of these practices, a refusal to let them slip into abstraction, you know, talk about the concreteness of how this word emerges rather than it's kind of abstract uh, sort of living in the world is, is one way to try to hold on to some sort of honesty with these words. So I would like to say a bit about, I, I think you used a really good word uh, in your talk, Astrida, the double death. That it's not only the individual death, but it, it's also the sort of the kin or species. Uh, and I, I think one other like, aspect of violence here, which is not connected to the sort of individual death, but to the sort of, of the death in a way of all that could have been in the sense of how we've sort of structured earth and that like, I don't know if the number is correct, but like uh, most of the ecosystem, like the biomass, we have sort of taken away the potential for that to be in our sort of domestication of the world. Uh, like, and that our sort of animals, our domesticated animals have sort of taken away sort of the potentiality, so, so, so to say, of the biosphere and that there's so much violence also in like in, in this in the sense that it's not connected to the sort of the, the moment of death in a way but this of depriving not only people but also animals of the sort of potential to be in a way which i think is important one of the good entry points to the question of the relation between care and science can be also um, the yesterday's lecture by Holly Jean Back, who uh, is really great in making this kind of rotation from seeing certain practices of carbon capture, for example, as a mere technique or technology, but instead looking at it as a kind of like cultural practice or cultural, cultural project. And I think that also instructs us to see in a spirit of so, much, so many literature about uh, anthropology of science to look at the science as a cultural practice and then the question of care becomes becomes more in a way i want to avoid that word but i guess it's it's fitting at this point it's more natural to think about science as cultural practice and then also it's more natural to bring the question of care into thinking about science as a cultural practice then and so uh to me sometimes also the care is uh, in this relation is a uh, a category that doesn't necessarily have to be individualized or psychologized. It can be, again, uh, seen 
as a, a sort of a cultural collective uh, way how to, for example, recon also with uh, the extinction. Uh, the question of extinction, the way how to approach extinction was also a great uh, a problem for me when I was writing the book on comparative planetology and I even decided to devise a special category of how to think about the planet as inhabited by ghosts, this category of the spectral Earth. And seeing, I mean, thinking about these ghostly presences of the extinct species, I, that's also the way how we can see you know, uh, the entities that actually instruct us in some way how to care for uh, what is remained, how to even restore what uh, was lost in the spirit of, again, Holigin, Holigin Buck's uh, uh, book about geoengineering, where she calls also, where she calls some of these practices also the practices of climate restoration. Uh, that can be also, doesn't necessarily have to be violent technological intervention. It can also be about rewilding of the territories that were taken up by extensive agriculture and other modes of uh, uh, artificial landscaping. Uh, speaking also about the wonderful James C. Scott's Against the Great book, which I just recently read and extremely enjoyed. Thank you. Maybe the, like one of you has a question to each other or, or you want to say something as a, as a conclusion, if there is such a thing. <laughs> um, otherwise, thank you so much for this. It was really beautiful and happy that we had the chance to have a conversation and, and hear you all. And uh, yeah, I hope, I hope until very soon. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>